Uh, it's a good thing I wasn't trying to bring this uh, message last week because um, it would have been a right laugh trying to give a sermon on the breath in my lungs when I was having trouble uh, holding breath in my lungs because I didn't have a voice to sing with. It would have just been exhaled with a hacking cough. So um, I'm feeling much better this week, which is good. Hey, um, about a year ago, I was having a conversation with a, a pastor friend of mine. I'd picked him up from the airport. We were going to a meeting, but we had a little bit of time to kill. So we went and had a coffee beforehand. And we were sitting and talking about uh, our pastors' conference, our national pastors' conference, which had been on a few weeks beforehand. And it was a really positive conversation. We were talking and uh, just saying, hey, wasn't the, the teaching good and the fellowship good? Really enjoyed that. And then my pastor friend said to me, but Nathan, there was this one song, and we sang it over and over again. And he goes, and every time I thought, what are we singing about? Anybody ever had that experience? What are we singing? Breath in our lungs. What is this all about? Why am I singing about breath? You know, and I tried to kind of empathize with a little, him a little bit at first. I went, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit different. Is it? It's not that bad. No, no, this song was terrible. Anyway, he went on and on and on about it. Have you ever been in that place? I mean, I know that I have sometimes. When I've come into church, and, uh, and sometimes it feels like everybody else around you is worshiping and entering in. And you, you, you can come in and, and kind of look at the words on the screen and just think, what are they getting all in, in a lather about? What are they getting all so excited about here, right? <laughs> it happens. And, you know, it's very frustrating sometimes when you come into church and perhaps you have a, a perception, an idea of how you think worship should be or, or how maybe you expected to find God, even though that's not what worship is all about. But sometimes we do have these preconceived notions. So it's actually, it's a good question. There's nothing wrong. If you come in and sometimes in and, and, and singing or, or, or whatever aspect of, of your worship it is, and there's something there that you kind of don't fully understand, there's nothing wrong with asking the question. As long as it doesn't become a stumbling block... And I think sometimes what happens is we then allow that thing to become an obstacle between us and God, and it becomes difficult to, uh, to worship. And so sometimes we settle for our own concept of God rather than willing to be amazed by what we don't know about God. Does that make sense? Here's another way of, of putting it. Max Licardo, who's one of the top um, Christian writers of the 20th and 21st century, he said this, he goes, you don't need to carry the burden of a lesser God. Let that sink in a little bit. A God on a shelf, a God in a box, or a God in a bottle. See, that's what we do sometimes. We try and come up with our version of God and our understanding of God, which pales in significance to what uh, God is really like sometimes. He says, no, you need a God who can place 100 billion stars in our galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the universe. In other words, we need to make sure we don't lose that sense of awe when we're worshipping God, just because perhaps we see something that we don't fully understand or there might be uh, technicalities something, the wording of something that doesn't necessarily sit well with us. John Piper, another great writer, said, the hindrance to worship, the great hindrance to worship, is not that we are a pleasure-seeking people, but that we are willing to settle for such pitiful pleasures. In other words, sometimes we're willing to settle for that little boxed-up image of God, and we think that God has to appear like that all the time. Now, worship should perhaps look a little bit more like how it's described in Psalm 16, verse 11, where it says, in your presence there's a fullness of joy. That when we come in, and it doesn't matter where we are, really. I have worshipped in, in Catholic churches and Baptist churches, uniting churches, uh, in ecumenical services where different groups get together. 
and enjoyed worshipping. I've been into uh, uh, an Indonesian church where the whole service was conducted in Indonesian. I had no idea what was being said, but I could sense the presence of God. And so it's, it's possible to still enter into the worship even in those circumstances. It's a fullness of joy. However, sometimes it ends up looking a little bit more like this, the description in Romans chapter 1, where it says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator. That's pretty sobering, but that's what happens sometimes. We start to worship the created things, the smoke, the mirrors, the sound effects, the songs, the style of preaching that we might like. And those things become a distraction from worshipping God. Okay, so coming back to this song, Greater You, Lord. What is it about? Well, it's actually based on a passage of Scripture from Ezekiel. So if you've got a Bible there with you, flick over to Ezekiel chapter 37. If you don't have it, we're going to have it up here on the screen. Ezekiel 37. Now, Ezekiel was an Old Testament uh, prophet, he wrote down a lot of the prophetic visions and, and ideas uh, that, that God gave to him. And, um, and this one in particular, at first kind of seems a bit unusual. And so uh, we're going to read through it tonight. So Ezekiel, and I, I'm, <laughs> it doesn't specifically say here in this passage... Um, I'm not 100% sure that this was a reality for Ezekiel. I think he was having some sort of prophetic vision. It says there, the hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. So I think this, the spirit was giving him uh, a vision, a picture here. And it says it was full of bones and he led me back and forth among them. And I saw a great many number of bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Now, you've got to pause and picture this for a second. That's incredibly sobering and harrowing. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, pictures of, like, concentration camps and things like that. And it can, it can take our breath away to see images of bones and if we engage with it well sometimes we, we don't want to engage with it we go well no, I don't really want to look at that that offends my sensibilities why am I why, why would I want to look at that we don't want to be confronted with such a reality but sometimes I think God wants us just to take it in it says there that he just he led Ezekiel back and forth why didn't he just take him there and say, Ezekiel, look at this. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Boom, 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 boom. No, he said, take it in. Just look around at this. God wants us to be moved by what we see in the natural to challenge what we might believe for in the supernatural. So it's interesting. God shows him around, and then he says to Ezekiel, he says, son of man, can these bones live? Now, Ezekiel gives either a very wise answer or a massive cop-out answer here. Have we got it up there on screen? Yes. He says, well, Lord, you alone know. That's a good cop-out answer. So God thinks, okay, we're going to test him a little bit on this one. Verse 4, he says, he says to Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. Speak to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'm going to make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you, and I'm going to cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Now, I don't know how you would feel if you were in that position, if God showed you a pile of bones, and they said, okay, I want you to talk to those bones and tell them they're going to come to life. I don't know how easy you would find, I know I would find that uh, somewhat difficult. Anyway, Ezekiel says, well, I prophesied just as I was commanded. And he says, as I'm prophesying, there's a noise. 
It's like, just picture it. Like a little rattle, you know? Little rattling noise, and then the bones start coming together, right? Bone to bone, right? The toe bone connected to the foot bone, <laughs> and then the foot bone connected to the ankle bone, and the ankle bone connected to the... Anyway, you know the, you know the rest of it, right? That's, that song is also based on this passage of Scripture. What does it finish on? Hear the word of the Lord. That's what's going on here. The bones come together. And then Ezekiel says, I looked and the tendons and the flesh appeared on them and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. I mean, this is pretty incredible. Can you imagine if you were having this kind of uh, a vision? Now, God is in the business of breathing life into things. That's what this passage says. Notice he starts off by saying, prophesy to the bones. What an odd thing to say. Speak to the bones. I want to say to you, if there are situations and circumstances in your life that appear dead, that appear hopeless, that appear beyond repair, if God has promised you otherwise, you can speak to those dead situations, to those dead bones in the power of Christ. And he will bring life if he has promised that. Speak life and hope to those dead, hopeless situations. And then he says, verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Now, breath and water are both symbols of the Holy Spirit, particularly in prophetic writing. And it's certainly confirmed in this passage a little bit later on when we, when we get to it. It says, prophesy to the breath. So it's saying, okay, now you speak to the Holy Spirit. Prophesy, son of man, say to the Spirit, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. He says, so I prophesied as he commanded and breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. I mean, this is pretty incredible. Can you imagine if you were visualizing this? You would be like bouncing off the ceiling. You would be excited at what God was doing, right? So he says, first speak to the bones, first speak to the circumstances, then to the Spirit. Prophesy to the Spirit. Now, like I said, I'm not sure how real this was for Ezekiel. Maybe he was convinced that this is actually he was seeing this. I think it was probably some sort of prophetic vision because God then explains it to him, what the significance of these things Ah, verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. He said they were like dead bones. In fact, they said of themselves, our bones are dried up and our hopes gone, we're cut off. Therefore prophesy to them and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'll bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. He keeps saying that. You will know that I'm the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. And then he finishes on, on this. And this is the real power-packed bit. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. What Ezekiel was seeing in this vision is what God was about to do through his son Jesus. And it's a prefiguring of how the dead in Christ will rise when Christ comes again. It's a prefiguring of, of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all flesh, which we know from Acts chapter 2. And I believe God is still saying there that tonight. God is speaking that verse of our lives even tonight. He wants to pour out His Spirit. He wants to see you live. He wants to see you settled in the land that you're in so that you will know that He is the Lord. Now, God literally brought Jesus back from, from the grave after He'd been dead for three days. And Jesus alluded to that promise of the Holy Spirit, both before before he went to the cross and afterwards. 
In John 14, when he was talking with his disciples and they sat around there, he promised again the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, you can read it in John 20, 23, 22, 23. Uh, it says, he, uh, he, again, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And it says he breathed on them. Again, that metaphor of a breath. And then just before he returned to the Father, he was with the disciples, they're questioning him, they're querying him. And uh, they were asking about the return of uh, reestablishing the kingdom of Israel. He says, look, you don't need to know the time on that. He goes, but, verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that word power there is, is a Greek word, dunamis. It means to be able, to have power, can do attitude. It's not like power to control. It's power to energize and strengthen, right? We've got a lot to be thankful for. Be thankful for life itself. God breathed life into the world when he made Adam and Eve, when he created the world, when he made the stars, when he made the seas, when he made the land, when he created all the animals, the birds the fish, and then he creates men and women in his image, and he breathes life into them. He breathed life into you and I. It says in, in the Psalms that he knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. He physically breathed life into us, and he breathed spiritual life into our dead sinful bones because of Jesus' victory on the cross and his promise to raise us up. You know, I had a, a real turnaround in the way I perceived perhaps some of my obstacles in worship a few years ago. Um, I thought I was doing pretty good. I was very satisfied with where I was at. I was happy. There wasn't anything I was really seeking God for, to be honest. I just thought, you know, I'm in a good place. I'm loving what's happening in church and life, and it's all good. And then I went to a conference, and we were worshiping uh, at this conference, and we were singing that song that we sang earlier tonight, Revelation Song. And it got to that line, Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. And something in me, just this little voice said, are you hungry enough for this? Like, are you hungry enough to want to see the things of God happening in your life and in your church? And I realized I wasn't. And in that moment, I realized that I needed the active work of the Holy Spirit like it was oxygen in my lungs, like it was as, 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 as habitual as breathing in and breathing out. That's what we need on a daily basis. It was like water in my body, blood in my veins. I'm spiritually dead without it. I need to be in that close relationship with him, and nobody else can do it for me. I've got to do it. I've got a hunger for it. I've got to be desperate enough to want to keep it on top of it and to worship him. And so I'm not going to let things get in front of me. I've got to put those obstacles to one side and pursue Jesus at all costs. And that's what I want to say to you tonight that as worshipers of Jesus, we've got to be careful that we don't let those obstacles get in the way. Yeah? Maybe it's a song lyric. Maybe it's something that you've been critical of or something you've been blind to. Maybe you've put God in a box or put him on a shelf. Don't settle for that lesser God or that pitiful imitation of God. Maybe your worship's been conditional. It's like, yeah, I love Jesus. But, you know, I don't really like singing or, no, I don't want to lift my hands. I'll, I'll do it on my terms. And I say we need to push past those barriers, those obstacles. Just continue to be in awe of God. There is so much about God we don't know and we're never going to know. And that's fine. We shouldn't, we are not God. <laughs> And we shouldn't know all there is to know about God. If we did, I think it would blow our minds, really. 
But there's nothing wrong with being in awe of the bigness of God, the wonder of God as creator. And so we need to be constantly breathing in his spirit through worship, through the reading of the word. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 that all scripture is God-breathed. It's like drawing in from his spirit through the word and through worship and prayer. Let me finish on this. That last verse, Ezekiel 37 verse 14. He says, I will put my spirit in you. That is a promise. It's his breath in your lungs. And you will live. That's a promise. If you feel dead, if you feel uh, just stuck, if you feel hopeless, you feel like things are going nowhere, you will live. I will settle you in your land. That is another promise. If you feel unsettled or unsatisfied, unsuccessful, uncomfortable in your own skin, God says, I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. See, that's a promise. You will know that you know that God is at work in your own life and it will motivate you to want to testify to that and outwork that in your own life so that you are strengthening and encouraging others around you. It's His breath in our lungs. And so in return tonight, let's pour out our praise to Him. Amen?